Hi students, Professor Gray here. We need to continue on with the acid-base chapter and in this lecture we're going to talk about conjugate acid-base pairs and then we'll do some molecular equations, total ionic equations, and net ionic equations. So first, conjugate acid-base pairs. So uh, what we see is that every acid has a conjugate base and every base has a conjugate acid. And what on earth am I talking about? Well, let's take a look at the equation down here. So remember that an acid is going to be a proton donator. Okay, so it's gonna give away an H plus. And a base, how we defined that was that it was either something that gave away a hydroxide or it was an H plus or a proton acceptor. So keeping that in mind, we can look at the equation here and see that HA is a generic acid. That has an H to give away. And when it gives its H away, it's going to become A minus over on the other side. So just think if HA was HCl. If that comes apart, it's going to come apart into H plus and Cl minus. And if you need the lone pairs, there they are. But a lot of times we draw it without the lone pairs and just assume that you guys know that it's there. So HA is the acid and we call A minus the conjugate base. And B, B is the base. So HA, the acid, is reacting with B, the base. And the base is going to accept the H plus from the acid and it will become a BH plus because the H is a plus one and if you have something that's neutral like the B and you add to it a plus one, it's gonna have a net charge of plus one. So that's where the plus comes from. So BH, uh, that is going to be our conjugate acid. Okay, so the conjugate acid base pairs are HA and A minus and B and BH plus. Those are our pairs there. So we can see that HA becomes A minus and B becomes B plus. H plus when we do the reaction so we can see what happens to them uh, when the reaction happens. Now the conjugate base and the conjugate acid those are just acids in bases so they're not anything that's special it's just that uh, we call it something different so we can differentiate between what's on the left hand side of the reaction arrows and what's on the right hand side of the reaction arrows so a minus that is a base and bh plus that is an acid so if we were to look at the equation going in this direction which happens because the double arrows mean that we've reached an equ equilibrium uh, situation and so the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backwards reaction. So the conjugate acid right here, that is an acid, so it has an H plus to donate. That is right there, okay? So if it gave its H plus away, it would become what? 
it would become B, which would be its conjugate base if this we just called that the regular acid. Now, A minus, that is just a base. So if we're going in this direction, we could just call that the base instead of the conjugate base. And a base, remember, is an H plus acceptor. So if it accepts an H, it's going to go from A minus to HA, and then HA would be its conjugate acid, okay? So don't worry about whether it's a regular acid or a conjugate acid or a regular base or a conjugate base. If it's an acid, it's an acid. If it's a base, it's a base, okay? So... <clears throat> That's conjugate acid base pairs. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, what on earth is she talking about? Don't worry, I have more examples for you. So let's take a look at these equations here. So we have hydrofluoric acid. That's that guy right there. And we're gonna put it into some water. Now hydrofluoric acid is the acid on this side of the equation. And if you put water with an acid, water will behave as a base, okay? So the acid HF is an acid, so it's gonna give away what? It's gonna give away an H plus, a proton. And water is behaving as a base, so it's gonna do what? It's gonna accept that proton, okay? So when the acid gives away its proton, it's gonna become F minus, the fluoride ion. So F minus is the conjugate base. So our pairs over here, we've got HF and F minus. And that little slash is not divided by, I'm just separating them for you guys. And the base has a conjugate acid. So when the base does its thing and accepts an H+, plus, it becomes this guy over here, the conjugate acid, and H3O plus is called what? Do you guys remember? It's called hydronium. So we can write this pair as H2O and H3O plus, or you could have written it H3O plus and H2O. It's, it's a pair in either way you write it. And if we take a look at the bottom equation, what we have is we have ammonia paired with water. Now, one of the parts of this subject right here is figuring out who's the base and who's the acid. On the top equation, they're labeled for you, but on the bottom equation, we have to figure this out. So we're taking a look at uh, ammonia plus water is going to give us ammonium. Ammonium is NH4 plus. That's a polyatomic ion we've seen before. Plus hydroxide, OH minus. Now, we learned in the last lecture that hydroxide is a base. And that's always going to be a base. And you're never going to label it as an acid, whether you think it's an, an acid or a conjugate acid or whatever. It's never an acid. Hydroxide OH minus is always a base. Okay, it's going to be the base or the conjugate base. So that means that if it's over here on the right hand side of the equation, we usually label that as the conjugate base. And if it came from H2O, which the equation is showing you right now, that means that water must be acting as the what? As the acid, because remember we have an acid base pair here. So if water is behaving as the acid, then it must be giving away its what? must be giving away an H plus. So it gives away an H plus and it becomes OH minus. Now, if you want to rewrite H2O as HOH, sometimes that makes it, but it makes you better able to see uh, what happens when you give away a hydrogen. Now, the other way that we can start to identify which is the acid and which is the base is if we look at the reactant side of the equation over here and we go, hmm, we've got two molecules, NH3 and H2O, that both have hydrogens on them. So it looks like we've got two acids there. So what's going on? We're going to want to remember that a lot of times when you have a molecule that has a nitrogen in it, 
It'll look like it's an acid because it's got those three hydrogens there, but the lone pair on the nitrogen will actually reach out and grab a hydrogen. So remember there's a lone pair right there. And when you reach out and steal somebody's hydrogen, their H+, plus, their proton, you are a proton acceptor. And if you are a proton acceptor, that means you are what? Are you an acid or a base? You are a base. And we had that written right here, proton acceptor. And where we saw the nitrogen containing compounds was right back here. Okay, so we saw that the weak bases, a lot of times those are the ones that have nitrogens in them and the nitrogen will still an H plus and you guys can see that it goes from NH3 to NH4 plus over there. So the ammonia is the base here. And when it accepts an H plus a proton, it becomes ammonium over there. So ammonium is the what? Ammonium is the conjugate acid. Now remember we said that conjugate acids and conjugate bases, they're just acids and bases. So you wanna make sure that if you call something a conjugate base, that it is gonna behave like a base. And if you, you wanna make sure that if you've got a base that's definitely a base, like hydroxide, that you're calling it a base. And this should make sense that ammonium is an acid because it's got a whole lot of hydrogens. Uh, there to work with. Now let's go ahead and do some problems. So let's identify the conjugate bases for the following acids. So we'll label these as our acids and we want to identify what the conjugate base would be. Now remember that an acid is a proton donator. So it likes to give away its H+. Plus. So if HBr gives away its hydrogen, we're just going to be left with Br. But remember that when the H plus takes off, it's going to leave behind these electrons right here for the bromine, and that will become the ion bromide. So if we pull it apart and one of them has a plus charge, then the other one has to have a minus charge. So we have conservation of charge. So you would write Br minus for the conjugate base. You could put the lone pair electrons on there if you would like, but remember, we assume that you know that they're there, unfortunately. Okay, so we have H2S. So if it, if it behaves as an acid, it's gonna give away a what? an H plus. So that's going to leave us with HS. And if it gives away a plus one, so if it was originally neutral and it gives away one of its plus charges, you're going to be left with what charge? Minus. And next we have carbonic acid, H2CO3. So if it behaves as an acid, again, it gives away what? it's H plus. So we're left with just one hydrogen. So we have HCO3 and if it gave away a plus charge and it was originally neutral, you're left with what charge? You're left with minus. Okay. So those are the conjugate acid base pairs for um, one, two, and three. Okay, so number numbers four, five, and six, identify the conjugate acids for the following bases. So here we have our bases. And we want to identify our conjugate acids. So remember that a base is going to be something that will give off an OH minus, or it's something that is a proton acceptor. All right, so if we have NO2, which is nitrite, the polyatomic ion nitrite, and it accepts an H plus, 
we're going to have HNO2. And what do we think the charge is going to be on that conjugate acid there? If we originally have a minus 1, and then we add a plus 1 to that. So minus 1 and plus 1 make what charge? 0. So HNO2 is neutral. Number 5, we have our friend ammonia. We've seen this one a bunch of times now. So NH3 behaving as a base is going to accept NH+, plus, and so it'll go from NH3 to NH4. And what will the charge on it be if it starts out at a neutral charge and you add a plus 1 to it? It's going to be a plus 1 charge. And remember, we don't have to write the 1 on a plus 1, but if it's plus 2 or plus 3 or plus 4, you have to write that number. Okay, then we have hydroxide. Hydroxide is our quintessential base. And it is a minus one, and we're gonna add a plus one to it. So minus one and plus one make what kind of charge? Neutral, so whatever the conjugate acid is, it is neutral. And if we have OH and we add another H to it, that's going to give us HOH, or more commonly known as H2O, and that's neutral. Now, what you might have noticed is acids tend to be neutral or positively charged. This is in general. And bases tend to be neutral or negatively charged. And again, that's in general. So we can see how our bases over here are negatively charged. And over here, two of them are negatively charged and one of them is neutral. And over here for our acids, what we see is they're neutral here. And over here you have two neutrals and you have one that's positively charged. So you can see the trends there. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. So it says in the following equations, we want to identify the conjugate acid base pairs. Alrighty, so for number one, we have HCl and we have H2O. So HCl is what? We usually call that hydrochloric acid. So we have hydrochloric acid and we're pairing that with water. So which one do you think is the acid, you guys? Probably the one that has acid in its name. So we've got the acid here hydrochloric acid. And when you pair water with an acid, water will behave like what? It will behave as a base. Okay, so we've got the acid and the base. Now the acid is going to give away its what? It's going to give away its H+. And when it does that, what's left over is Cl-, minus. okay? So this is the conjugate acid base pair here. So we can say that the chloride is our conjugate base. And the other way that we can write it is over here, we can say HCl and chloride, that's a conjugate acid base pair. Now, water is behaving as the base here, and remember, bases are proton acceptors, so they're H plus acceptors. So when H2O accepts an H plus, it becomes H3O plus over there. So that means that H3O plus is our what? That is our conjugate acid. So the other pair is H2O and H3O+. Alrighty, 
at the bottom there, we have C5H5N and water. Now, C5H5N is something that we've seen before. And when we're looking at those two reactants and we're going, oh my goodness, which one is the acid and which one is the base, what we'll want to notice is that C5H5N has a nitrogen right there. So that's probably one of those weak bases that we've seen before, and indeed it is. So if we back up back here, here we have it. This is pyridine. So those black balls, those are carbons. So we see how we have five carbons. And the white balls, those are hydrogens, so we can see how we have five hydrogens. And the blue ball, that is nitrogen, so C5H5N. And the lone pair on the nitrogen, those are going to be the electrons that reach out and grab the H+. Plus. So we've got pyridine there. And that is behaving as the base. So it's going to be the proton acceptor. And we can see over here how indeed it has accepted an H+. Plus. So that's going to be the base. And after it accepts the H+, plus, it becomes C5H6N. And the H+, plus brought with it a positive 1. So now it goes from neutral to positive 1. So C5H6N is the what? That is the conjugate acid, okay? It has an extra H plus now that it, if it gives it away, it goes back to regular old pyridine, which is C5H5N. Now, water is one of those interesting beasts that can go either way. If you pair it with an acid, it behaves as a base. And when you pair it with a base, like we did in number two, it behaves as what? It behaves as an acid. And we can see that it's doing that in this equation because the lone pair on the nitrogen is gonna reach out and grab that H plus. And the bond that's between the hydrogen and the oxygen, those two electrons that are bonding, fall back onto the oxygen and become a third lone pair. And if I draw those in, you can see them, they're right there, okay? So water is the acid, and hydroxide OH minus is the what? That is the conjugate base. And that should make sense to you guys because hydroxide OH minus is always the base, okay? So base or conjugate base, hydroxide is it. So our pairs over here, We've got pyridine and the pyridinium ion. And we have water and we have hydroxide, okay? Now there's something I want you guys to notice. It's that hydronium and hydroxide are not acid-base pairs. So, not conjugate acid base pairs. Hydronium and water are a conjugate acid base pair and water and hydroxide are a conjugate acid base pair. Okay, so keep that in mind. You don't want to do this because then you're working with it too H plus is there. We just want to go one H plus at a time. All right, so this slide right here, what it's showing us, it's showing us a lot of acids and their conjugate bases. And what we'll notice on this slide is when you have a strong acid, like perchloric acid or sulfuric acid, what happens is that you have a very weak conjugate base. Okay, so a strong acid will give off a very weak 
conjugate base. And down at the bottom here, what we have on the other side is we have a strong base. Hydroxide is a strong base. So we have increasing base strength as we go down. And what we'll notice is a strong base or strong conjugate base will come from a very weak acid. Okay, so water is such a weak acid that sometimes it behaves as a base like we've seen before. Now, if we're in the middle, say at acetic acid, this is a weak acid. And when it gives away its acidic proton, which is right there, what it leaves is a weak conjugate base. Okay, so if you're a weak acid, your conjugate base will also be weak. If you are a strong acid, your conjugate base will be very weak. And if you are a very weak acid, your conjugate base will be a very strong base. So that's how our conjugates work. If one of them is very strong, the other one will be very weak. If one of them is weak, the other one will also be weak. Alrighty, so that brings us to neutralization reactions. So when we have strong acids and bases in an aqueous solution, an aqueous solution means there's what there? It means that there's water there. So we're throwing strong acids and strong bases into water and letting them react. When we do this, what they form is water and a salt. Now, remember in real life, the salt that we use in our kitchens for cooking is sodium chloride. But in chemistry, there are a lot of salts and that is a cation and an anion. And if we break down NaCl, we can see we've got a cation and an anion. And the cation does not always have to be sodium, and the anion does not always have to be chloride. So what happens is we have an acid, and we have a base. And the M there is not a new element. It just means metal. And these are going to react to form water and a salt. So we can also write the water as H2O. And we can see that in the example below. So we have hydrochloric acid, and that's going to react with sodium hydroxide, which is a base, and that should be obvious because bam, we can see the hydroxide right there. And the H will get together with the OH, and it'll make H2O or HOH. And the metal will get together with the anion right there and it'll make a salt. So NaCl or one of the other salts like KCl or KBr, NaBr. And in the next couple of slides, we're going to write out these reactions. But not only are we gonna write out these reactions, but we're gonna write it out in three different ways. So the problem says you want to write out the molecular, total ionic, and net ionic equations for the following reactions, the following acid-base reactions. So the molecular equation, that's just the equation that we're used to writing. So how we do that is we say we've got HBr, and we're going to indicate that that is dissolved in water. And we're going to react that with potassium hydroxide. And it should be obvious that potassium hydroxide is a base because it's got that OH, and then HBr, hydrobromic acid, has acid in the name. It's like hydrochloric acid. And we're going to react that, and we're going to form water and a metal. Or you can write the metal first and the water second. It doesn't matter. They're all floating around in the beaker together. 
So the H and the OH, they get together and they're gonna give us HOH or you guys can write it as H2O. And that is a covalent compound. And because it's a molecule that doesn't split up in water into ions, we're gonna write the liquid in the parentheses there. We're not gonna write that water is dissolved in water. So we don't wanna put AQ in the parentheses because that's just redundant, okay? So we're forming that pure compound water. And then what's left over is K plus and Br minus. And when we write an ionic formula, we put the cation first, the K plus, and then we write the anion second, the Br minus, and we don't put the charges in there. So this is a little bit of a review here. And we're gonna put Aq there because that's dissolved in water. And the K plus and the Br minus are actually floating around in the water on their own separate, but in the equation, the molecular equation, we write them together as KBr, okay? So the AQ is indicating that they're floating around in water on their own. All right, now we're gonna write the total ionic equation. So the total ionic equation takes a lot of space and you're gonna be writing AQ a whole lot. And this is separating everything out that's floating around on its own. So the H and the BR, when they're in uh, aqueous solution, when they're in water, they're not actually together. They separate into H plus and Br minus, so we have to write that out. So we say H plus and indicate that that's in water, plus Br minus Aq, plus potassium ion Aq, you're gonna write Aq a whole lot, like I said, plus your hydroxide, and that's just the reaction side. So all of those are floating around separate in the beaker. And this is gonna react, and this is going to form water, which is H2O, and we're gonna put the fancy L, the liquid there. And we don't write the H and the OH separate like it is on the left side of the equation because the H plus and the OH minus reacted together to form a molecule that stays together. It's not separated into its ions. It looks like this and all of that is together. So we draw that together. But the potassium in the bromide, they're still floating around on their own. So we have the bromide and we have the potassium, both with AQ in the parentheses. Now what we're saying when we write all of that out is this. So let me draw us a beaker here so we can visualize this. So what we have on the reactant side, H plus, Br minus, K plus, OH minus, and we've got all of these water molecules surrounding all of this. The AQ in parentheses is telling us, okay, these ions are in water. And when the reaction happens, what we have is the H plus and the OH minus get together and they form H2O, but the bromide and the potassium ion are still floating around on their own with all of the original water molecules that were there. And the red water molecule is exactly the same as the blue mo water molecules. Now, I just drew the one in red so you could see that it came from this guy and that guy right there, okay? 
So when we write out the total ionic equation, this right here, all of this blah, 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 is representing the beakers down there in what's happening. And it's telling you that these two things are not getting together in water to form that salt. And they're not taking part in the reaction at all. And because they're not taking part in anything, they're just floating around watching everybody do what they do. We call those spectator ions. They're just watching everybody else. All right, so that seemed like a lot of work, but you know what? We're not done yet. We have to write the net ionic equation. And for the net ionic equation, I need to erase this beaker here just so I have a little more room because we're going to use the total ionic equation to write our net ionic equation. So what we do when we write the net ionic equation is we look for things in the total ionic equation that are exactly the same on both sides. So the spectator ions. And because they're not doing anything, we're gonna cross them out. So we see how the bromide is exactly the same on each side of the equation. We're gonna ignore it, because it's not doing anything. And also who? The potassium ion. So what we're left with is that H plus is reacting with OH minus to give us H2O. And again, that's a fancy L for liquid. So that's our net ionic equation. So we have three different ways that we're representing this reaction here. So let's go ahead and do this again. Let's do this for HCl, so hydrochloric acid, and magnesium hydroxide. So for our molecular equation, we're gonna have HCl dissolved in water plus magnesium hydroxide dissolved in water. And that's gonna do an acid-base reaction to give us water and a salt. So we can write H2O or HOH, either way, you guys. And we're gonna write our salt. So magnesium right here is the cation. And magnesium likes to have a charge of what? Plus two. So right here in magnesium hydroxide, we've got magnesium that's plus two, and we have two hydroxides. They're both minus one there. So we're going to have magnesium and then how many chlorides? So we've got to keep in mind that we've got H plus and Cl minus there. So the chlorides are minus one each. And remember we have to make a neutral compound because a neutral compound is a happy compound. So if we have plus two and every chloride is minus one, we're gonna need two chlorides for that one magnesium. And of course, we're gonna have to put our AQ on there. So what this means is that in this equation, we're gonna have to do a little bit of balancing. And that's okay because we know how to balance things. So if we look at our magnesiums, and I purposely didn't do the hydrogen first because we've got two different kind of hydrogens going on. If we look at the magnesiums, we've got one on each side of the equation. So we're balanced there. Let's look at the chlorines. So we've got one on this side with HCl, but we've got two over here. So how many HCls do I need to have two chlorines on my reactant side? I need two. So I've got two here and I've got a coefficient of one there. And remember when your coefficient is one, you don't have to write it in there. And so that takes care of the chlorines, but now we can see we've got two hydrogens. And those hydrogens are showing up right there. 
and I separated the water into HOH so we can see the different hydrogens more clearly. So the OHs are here. So we've got two hydroxides in magnesium hydroxide and we've got two hydrogens on our HCl. So that means we need how many waters to balance that? We need two, okay? So that would be the molecular equation for this reaction. Now let's write out the total ionic equation. And this one's gonna be a little bit of work. So remember, we want to write out every piece that's floating around in that water. So HCl is going to split up into H plus and Cl minus. So we're going to have H plus, oops, why did that happen? I don't know. AQ plus Cl minus AQ to start things out but we have two of them. So they all, they both come apart. We have two HCLs and they both come apart into H plus and Cl minus. So we need to say that we've got two H pluses and two Cl minuses. And we don't put H2 and Cl2 because those H pluses and those Cl minuses, they are not in the form of H2 and Cl2. That's not how they are. So we have to write out how they are in their ionic form. Okay, plus we've got one magnesium and the magnesium that's floating around is a magnesium cation and it has a charge of plus two. And we have how many hydroxides? We've got two hydroxides. So we have two OH minus, and they're floating around in water, and they're separate. Those OH minuses are not together, so you don't write H2O2. That's hydrogen peroxide. Don't do that, okay? So we've got all of our separate pieces on the left-hand side of the equation, and I'm going to put those together now. So... What happens is, again, because this is a, an acid-base reaction, we're gonna form water and a salt. So we go ahead and we write our water, so HOH, and again, that is the pure liquid that we're forming. And the salt, we are gonna have our cation first. So I'm gonna write it down here so I have more room. and then the anion. Okay, so how many magnesiums do I have on the reactant side? I've got one. And how many chlorines do I have on the reactant side? I've got two. So I need a two here, and I can put the one here, but again, I don't need that. Oops, I made a mistake. Magnesium is plus two, bad teacher, bad, okay? And how many waters did we form? How many H2Os, how many HOHs? So we've got two hydrogens, two H pluses, and we have two OH minuses, so we formed two of those. And again, you don't separate the H plus and OH minus because you're forming that water and it's a covalent compound. So the H plus and OH minuses are no longer floating around on their own in the beaker. So again, with a beaker example, draw us a big beaker right here. And what we're going to have is this. And of course, we've got all of this stuff in water. And when we do the reaction, 
what we're going to end up with is formation of a couple of waters. So you guys can see that right here. And we're left with our magnesium and chloride ions still floating around, not doing a whole lot. So that means they're probably, what kind of ions? They're probably spectator ions. And again, you guys, the red H2Os are exactly the same as the blue H2Os. I was just putting them in red so I could show you that those ones came from this reaction right here, okay? So that's what the total ionic equation is telling you. Okay, so we're not done yet. Woohoo! More to do. We have to do the net ionic equation. So let me erase our beakers here and let's do the net ionic equation. Okay, so with a net ionic equation, we're going to cross out the things that are exactly the same on both sides of the total ionic equation because those pieces, those little guys are not doing anything. They're just spectating. So we can see that we've got two chlorides on the reactant side and the product side exactly the same. And we've got that magnesium cation that's exactly the same on both sides. So what we're left with is two protons or two H pluses that are reacting with two hydroxides, two OH minuses, and they are forming two waters, two HOHs. And that's the net ionic equation, but we're not quite done yet. No! So most of the time when we have coefficients that can all be divided by the same number, and give us whole numbers, we're gonna go ahead and do that. So if we reduce that, what it becomes is one H plus plus one OH minus is gonna give us one H2O. So remember to reduce it. Okay, we're not done yet. We have one more to practice with. So number three, we've got sulfurous acid and sodium hydroxide. So sulfurous acid is H2SO3, whereas sulfuric acid would be H2SO4. So for a review on that, you'll have to look at the oxyanion uh, section. Okay, so molecular equation for this one. We should be getting good at this by now. So the molecular equation for this acid-base reaction, we write out the acid and we put a Q on it and then we write the base and we put a Q on it and then over here we write water and we put liquid because that's what we do and then we're going to write the salt and the salt is the cation so na and the anion and our anion here is the polyatomic ion so3 minus two so that's sulfite. So we have SO3 and that's a minus two. So how many Na pluses do we need to balance that SO3? So SO3 minus two and the sodium there is just a plus one. How many sodiums do we need? We need two. So this is Na2SO3. So you guys can see that we might need to do a little bit of balancing on this one. All right, so since we have one sodium in NaOH and we have two sodiums in Na2SO3, we're going to need to put a two over here so our sodiums are balanced. Now looking at uh, the sulfurs and the oxygens, what I like my students to do is keep your polyatomics together as a package 
and balance the packages. So you've got a single SO3 on this side and a single SO3 on that side. So we're fine on the sulfates. So we're gonna move on to the hydrogens and the OHs. And remember I separated those hydrogens so it makes it easier on us. So let's take a look at our hydroxide right there. We've got two of them on this side right here. So we'll need to have two of them on the product side. And that solves our regular hydrogen right there problem because we've got two on the reactant side and so we needed two on the product side and we did that. So what we have is one, two, two, one for our coefficients. And again, remember if you have a coefficient of one, you don't need to write the one there. So go ahead and check it, make sure everything is balanced, and then you can move on to the total ionic equation. Okay, so for the total ionic equation, we're gonna write everything out separately. So the hydrogens on the H2SO3, those get released and they're separate. So we've got two H pluses, that's AQ. Now the sulfite, the sulfite stays together as a package and we've got one of those. So we have SO3 and when it's on its own, it's minus two. So we've got to write the charge in there. That's floating around in water. Plus NaOH, that's going to separate completely into Na plus and OH minus. And you can see we've got two of them. So what that looks like when it's floating around in water is this. So we're going to write we've got two sodiums floating around in water separately plus a couple of hydroxides floating around in solution separately and you got to get the charges right also. So there's a ton of components that go into these equations. And then when we do an acid base reaction, what we have is we have water that forms and that forms a covalent compound. So those two pieces, H plus and OH minus, are no longer separate. And what we have is two H pluses reacting with two OH minuses to make two HOHs or H2O, either way you wanna write them. And the sulfate and the two sodiums, those stay separate. Those are spectator ions. So if you guys need to draw out the beakers for this total ionic equation so you can see what's going on, go ahead and do that. But I've already done that twice now, so we're just gonna move on to the net ionic equation. All right, so for our net ionic equation, what we do is we cancel out the things that are the exact same on both sides of the equation. And we can see that our sulfate, our one sulfate is the same on both sides. It's not taking part in this reaction. It's just watching what's going on. And our sodium ion is also doing that, exactly the same on both sides. So what we're left with is two protons reacting with two hydroxides, and they are going to form two waters. Now again, we have a bunch of coefficients that can be divided by the same number to give us whole number answers. So they can all be divided by two, and that would give us a whole number of one for the coefficient. So we're gonna wanna reduce them and that is going to give us a single H plus reacting with a single hydroxide to give us a single water. And that is the end of this lecture. Phew, that was a lot of writing. Okay, I will see you in the next lecture.
and we will talk about KA and KB and KW. Super exciting stuff, you guys. Okay, bye-bye.